Third, that this process demands of us in humanity's current current um, stage of uh, pro progress or development. So, in saying that, I think the Baha'i community has been learning about the critical time of junior youth um, and engaging with them as being able to raise those those individuals. That this is actually a time of transition where the patterns and thoughts that will shape an individual's life and their interactions with others for the rest of their um, for the rest of their time here are shaped. And how we're how we're learning to do that really, and I think this speaks to a lot of the comments that have already been made, uh, is at the level of neighborhoods. So it looks like bringing these groups together on a regular basis in the setting of, of a neighborhood, giving them the space to um, be guided and supported often by an older youth or um, an adult there to meet and to think about um, the needs of the community around them. Now this time of transition is one where they're not children anymore and that actually to treat them as such is detrimental to their own development. So we find that when this age group of such great promise is brought together in these spaces um, and assisted to study materials that help them to understand certain spiritual concepts, such as their power to choose hope over despair, um, they're given permission to seek noble goals and make a mighty effort towards that, that um, some of the other ones, you know, to rid themselves of prejudice and to work together and form friendship based on service, that this is something uh, that is very transformative to the lives of those people. Um, an element of this program, I think, that is also quite of, of these efforts, that is also very transformative, is the opportunity to design and consult on projects, on service projects. So in this neighborhood, and my mouth is really dry. <laughs> Just take a pause. I know we have 30 minutes, and I'm thinking there's so much um, to share, so I'm just trying to speak to some of the main things. But it means speaking really quickly. Um, thank you, Ida. <laughs> and skipping over a few things as well in the first. <laughs> thank you. I'm um, taking time to the notes. So, yeah, so I think this, this profound opportunity to really look at, at the spiritual concepts and then to act, to look around your society and you know, discern what are the forces that are acting in society, those that are leading to negative impacts such as the impacts of media, and analyze them for themselves and choose actions that align to, um, to more constructive ways of um, saying, oh, full of full of special treatment, that's there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as these youth, as these youth come together, their, their service project, projects might start with something as simple as, you know, there's so much rubbish in our neighborhood, and we need to go and pick it up and clean up the neighborhood. But then, you know, as they're supported by these older youth, they start to see that okay, it's it's not merely the act of picking up that solves the problem. We have to think deeper. We have to involve others. And so in this way, families become a part of the conversation. Organizations that are working for this need start to become a part of the, cause of the conversation. And we see that junior youth become this catalyst for a process of social cohesion, where they're really a, a, a driving force and bringing together families and communities in a way where they're working together and building a vision of a community that's very different from the one that they exist in now. Um, so this has been a very exciting experience for all of those young people and neighborhoods that are involved in learning about the potential of this age group. Um, and maybe I'll just finish there as an introduction to some of the elements and look forward to sharing more on the questions option. Thank you. Invite um, Ansu to come up and, sure. and present what she's been involved with. Please welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, so, my name is Ansuya, and um, I'm from START, which stands for the Service for Treatment and Rehabilitation Against um, 
<laughs> the service for the treatment and rehabilitation of torture and trauma survivors. Um, I'm the evaluation officer for community development at SART. Well, I have a background in the future for all the things that we and the teaching. And so I am, that's okay. And um, so um, I'm always you know, looking for opportunities to do theatre work with young people. And uh, one of the projects that starts runs um, is a Friday afternoon at the Youth Centre. Um, where young people can drop into the Fairfield Youth Centre and we have a variety of different activities that they can be a part of. We have basketball and capoeira and boxing and so I thought I'd offer you know, um, theatre activities there too and the um, purpose of that was really just to um, have young people be a part of um, theatre games and exercises that were primarily um, focused on building trust and um, having people work together to, um, towards a, a goal, um, a theatre-based goal. And also over time to share stories about things that are important to them. And so um, the, the thing that was unique about this program is that it wasn't a structured program. Young people can drop in and out of the youth centre whenever they want. And so I didn't have a clear vision for what was going to unfold. They would be led by the young people and that's um, what we did. So. In the first week, we spent quite a bit of time just playing games, getting to know each other. Um, and all of the games, like I said, are, um, offer um, young people small opportunities to trust each other because when working with people from refugee and asylum seeker backgrounds, um, the process of um, resettlement and the effects of torture and trauma can have detrimental impacts on people's ability to be able to trust and connect to each other. So the theatre activities offered small opportunities to trust within a contained environment. One of the activities we did was around, um, we, I, it's borrowed from the Alternatives to Violence program called What's on Top. Um, and I asked young people to make an image with their bodies, to pretend that their body is clay, and make an image on what's at the top of your mind today, what's important for you. And that could be, I'm hungry, I had an amazing day, it could be, it could be anything. And um, there were various different images, and one of the girls had her head in her hands. And um, I invited young people to talk about why they made the images that um, they did. And in the first week, a young lady um, from Iraqi background was brave enough to share with me a story of how, or not just with me, but with a group of about um, eight young women, um, of how she had been bullied um, at school. She was a new arrival Iraqi refugee attending an IEC, and she was being bullied by some of the um, young people from the mainstream high school. And so um, in sharing her story, the other young people who also happened to be from the same school that wasn't planned, it just all happened that they were from the same school, also shared stories of how um, they had been experiencing bullying. So we started to use their stories and role plays, um, and we got to um, have young people test out different strategies for how they would deal with bullying in their schools, so whether that's going out and seeking support, whether that's being um, an upstander rather than a bystander, they got to test out different strategies for seeking support when they were being bullied. And also um, the theatre uh, workshops um, provided an opportunity for them to get to know each other better and to trust each other within a fairly safe environment. And it's, it sounds quite heavy, but we broke it up with lots of different fun games and activities as well that were focused on trust building and network building. And um, so what does this have to do with social cohesion? Well, um, I think there are different kinds of social cohesion. So within the community, for, when it's for the first instance, these girls had already known each other. They were all from Iraqi background and they were all going to the same school. But it, got, um, it provided them an opportunity to get to know each other better and to learn how to support each other better because they learned that they were experiencing similar things. Well, I'm sure they knew that already, but they got to explore in depth the um, similarities between their experiences. And then going forward, I also would like to um, we're in the process of developing a project that looks at running um, a uh, running projects with a mix of um, young people from IEC and high schools to start to build that social cohesion between um, young people from refugee backgrounds and um, the broader mainstream Australian society. So that's the initiative. We now um, like to welcome Class Bagel, who will speak about Neighbourhood Connect. Um, so the panel is 
how we're doing it. Um, we've heard two other panelists speak about uh, looking after people who have suffered trauma, um, also other groups of people who are connected through a spiritual common belief. We look at people whose connection is where they are, the street, the block of units, the neighborhood. So we're basically trying to helping people turn neighborhoods into communities, and so obviously achieving this connectedness that we spoke with about today, cohesion, and of course, ultimately happiness. So how do we do it? Well, we support neighborhood groups in most states and territories across Australia. We've got about 50 neighborhood groups in Victoria, New South Wales, Western Australia, Queensland, South Australia, and the ACT. Last year, we held about 130 events uh, with more than 400 people participating. And I think actually we've undercounted because me traveling around the country, because I spend half of my time in Melbourne and half of my time in New South Wales, I see more than those figures. And we probably have created tens of thousands of hours of connection. The connection that builds connectedness, that builds cohesion, and as we heard Hugh very clearly saying, if we don't feel connected, we are unhappy. And of course, my background is health data, uh, health information. Uh, we know a quarter of people feel lonely. What we may also heard today is that 32% are ill earlier, morbidities have come up earlier, and of course a much higher degree of self-harm, including suicide, if people feel lonely and not connected. So social cohesion is not just a nice concept, it's vitally important that more Australians, more of our um, citizens and residents basically live longer and happier lives. Here are some of the photos of the things we do. Whatever, it's a barbecue, have a cuppa, a cleanup that was mentioned earlier, a community garden, whatever. It's not so important what is done, but the fact that something is done and people talk. And it goes beyond the are you okay stuff because these groups move, you know, meet regularly every few weeks. A little bit different to Neighbour neighbor Day, which we've actually got a uh, liaison with. We've got an MOU with uh, Relationships Australia, which mentioned earlier today that you know, they, do, they do it once a year. We basically have Neighbour Days every couple of weeks. So yeah, bank offs, galleries, choirs, you name it, it doesn't matter. The important thing is the connection, the connectedness, and the social cohesion so that, that is created as a result. So this is my slide that says how to get from loneliness to happiness in four easy steps. Okay, so basically this usually starts off with a letter drop or a Facebook post in a neighborhood. And remember it is the physical location that counts. Could be a block of units, could be a street, could be three streets, depending on the location. Which usually results in a bunch of people meeting in a local cafe. People chat and catch up in a local cafe and say, this sounds good, we actually want to do, you know, want to do this more often. And the group forms. Big Ideas Forum is a new quarterly forum by Northern Beaches Council. Uh, it runs at a Glen Street Theatre in Belrose, it's a really lovely venue. Um, and its aim, as you can see there, is to engage the community in a robust exchange of ideas. So it really is not too dissimilar today to getting people invested in social issues, things that really matter, uh, and to get a panel of uh, interesting people, people who are quite accomplished, experts in their field, together with local representatives, often heads of community services or groups, to then have um, often a presentation aspect, but then a, a Q&A, extended discussion, uh, followed by then kind of a very intentional um, socialising afterwards. There's, there's, there's free food, there's musicians, we always have local young artists playing, sometimes theatre groups, that kind of thing, to really then promote, after the actual session of content where we've looked at all the different issues, to really be trying to boost those connections, especially between members in our community who are interested in to be getting more involved with services who are present, who have all their stalls there afterwards. So uh, I've only got one or two other slides to give it a little bit more context. As you can see there, we always have an aspect of performance art and local partnerships. Um, all the podcasts for this, it only started in March this year, so you can actually go to Council website or Glen Street website and check some of the previous um, evenings. It's all recorded and all available uh, to be viewed. Um, 
In terms of choosing the actual themes for what we want to address, you can see up there, that actually comes out of our community strategic plan in terms of the theming of, I guess, what we consider to be the four priorities of local government, environment, sustainability, community and wellbeing, which is, I guess, specifically where the social cohesion part will come out of, innovation and enterprise, and politics and participation. That's uh, just at a glance, just what we've had this year thus far, and funnily enough, the opening video would have had Hugh Mackay screened all over it. He was kind of launching the, the first one, which was really nice. Um, but then you can see there a variety of topics, often deliberately either contentious, controversial, those kind of areas where we know we need to talk about this more often, but we're not doing it. And I guess what we find is often these discussions get polarised online, uh, and we're not meeting face to face. So it's really trying to get local government, local councils, creating those platforms at the local level. Um, prior to working at Northern Beaches, I was at Wallara Council, where I set up the Wallara School of Philosophy with a very similar intent in partnership with UNSW and the Sydney, Sydney University. So um, you can see the next one there in November is just uh, two weeks' time on a Friday. Um, got some lovely people to come and present, so you're most welcome to come. I think that might be my final slide as an intro. So there we go. Thank you and look forward to being a part of the discussion. Thank you. My name is May. I'm from Twende Theatre. The word Twende is actually from Swahili, East Africa. It means let's go, and it implies that we only advance when we work together, and we progress when we hesitate less. So what we do in Twende is we make theatre and tell stories with young people in the southeast of Melbourne. What we do is we use rap, music, song, poetry, TikTok videos, if you know what that is, to tell stories with young people and make those stories together. Um, to give you a little bit of a picture of what's happening in the Southeast, it's kind of like there are many friends from different backgrounds, speaking many different languages, living in this geographical area. And there are very few spaces where these friends get to, to start talking about and learning about what the culture is that they're building together as friends from different backgrounds. Um, so what Twenda does is it gives them a space to start thinking about those things, thinking about the questions of like, what does it mean to be human? What is our human identity? What does it mean to be a young person in this day and age? What does it mean to be on this land, on this history, but also what is the history that we would like to build? And what is the culture that we're building together as young people in the Southeast? So what we do is we build two skills within these young people to get them to start thinking about these questions. Um, the first skill is that of like reading a reality, reading where they are. And the second is that of contributing to it. We, do, we build those skills through the world of play and game in theatre. So in a game, young people have to contribute. They can't step out, otherwise the team doesn't move forward. And the team wants to move forward. So we start with very simple games where they read, okay, what's happening in the game? What do I have to do? Give something, and then the team moves forward. And then we complexify the games a little bit and start to weave in these concepts of what does it mean to be human, exploring it together with them, and creating, I guess, like a unity of a vi vision around these things in a, in a group. And then we start to see, actually, in those spaces, as we increase the complexity of the games and the depths of the concepts, that these young people are able to apply those skills to read the reality and then to contribute to it outside of the walls of the theatre and in their community that they live in. And something that we're seeing across, I guess, the board with young people is that there's a, there's a sense of passivity and also like a never, never able to be present kind of thing. And I think it's not just young people, it's, it's all of us. We're never here. And in the world of play and in the world of theater, you have to be there in the game. Your body is there and your mind is there. So the game can continue. And so what it does is it, gives, it builds that muscle of presence. So then we have young people exploring these deep concepts, also building the ability to contribute to those deep things um, in a space that is loving and encouraging. Um, and they're building a story. Who doesn't love stories? So that's what we do in Twende. Thank you very much again. But just to have a discussion around certain aspects um, and how it shapes what they do. So firstly, we might look at um, what the principles, beliefs, or convictions, or ideas that you have about human beings and society, which help you shape this initiative. 
<laughs> That's the one. Yeah. <laughs> we, we don't ask the simple questions. I might end with what did you have for breakfast, but you know, just sort of lighten it up. But, but yes, you can use that one and we'll share this one. So maybe, Will, would you like to begin? I'm happy to begin. There we go. Um, wow, what a question. Um, I guess, um, and this is reflected from a lot of recent reading of mine, I did plug for a book, The Righteous Mind by Jonathan Haidt, if you've never heard that before. Um, but really, um, looking to moral psychology, in terms of as social creatures, we actually aren't just governed by self-interest. So as we know, with so much of our society, we're geared towards a framework that really allows us with that, and there are many fantastic things about personal freedoms and autonomy and agency, but we're social creatures, and so we are desperately dependent on each other. And um, so with that, I guess what I would say is often we've had, um, that's the place of spirituality and religion and things that bind us together and give us a vision beyond egoism. So I guess I, I just suggest as a framing, it is how do we balance the imperative of self-interest which is so important to for society, together with the absolute imperative of investing ourselves in things beyond ourselves um, as a part of collective well-being. Whether you endow that with spiritual meaning or not is actually secondary in my mind, but the whole point of beyond doing it, egoism and participation in the collective. <laughs> Would anyone like to build on that? Maybe we can have uh, Ruha or Anne's um, sure, well, um, really captured that really well, but I think um, one of the key convictions I have is that everybody wants to feel accepted, everybody wants to feel connected, and everybody wants to feel supported. Um, yeah, that's all I have to add to that. I've, I've actually asked them to like think about like um, everyone contributing, so they're all being very polite. <laughs> Um, I just wanted, because I think this triggered one of the thoughts that I had in my mind also, is that um, those working with the, this particular initiative, these particular initiatives in, in neighbourhoods, have the conviction that every young person really um, yearns to make a contribution to society that is meaningful and that can transform and impact. And um, when given the opportunity, you know, we kind of view that individuals are organic with the society around them and when we choose to look at young people in a certain way it allows them to arise to a standard that actually innately they're fighting to, to realize um, within themselves so removing those barriers is, is part of the process and choosing to see that in every individual um, you know youth or sometimes we, you know the younger youth termed as junior youth um, really is this innate nobility, and sometimes society doesn't allow us to see that. You know, we look at, we might look at this age group and say it's problematic, or that they're kind of in this time where they're just naturally a very self-centered time, or they become very rebellious, and you know, within the family mode. But that these are actually expressions of an energy, a time that hasn't found a pathway to be released, or you know, channeled into something constructive. And so it's for us that are the community around these young people to also make. Adjustments, I think, is one of um, yeah, a really strong conviction that I shared. Mm -hmm. Um, just to echo that, in the southeast of Melbourne, there's a heavy weight of helpless, helplessness amongst young people. Like, we want the change, we want to see it, we just don't know how. Um, but when we're given an opportunity to start contributing to it, then we build the muscles to keep um, riding this bicycle of change and keep going. Um, so yeah, echoing that, it's, it's the conviction that young people are, are champions of justice and they're builders of unity and that we work towards that. Maybe it's a last and slightly diverging view. We keep talking about cohesion and connecting. Um, what it can be also about is reconnecting. I grew up in England in a cul-de-sac of you know, 20 houses. Um, I went to Switzerland to a school where there was four classrooms, sorry, in one, four years in one classroom. And I you know, lived in a small um, village in Germany that had 4,000 people. There was cohesion everywhere. There was connected to everybody. Everybody knew what I was doing and I hated it. <laughs> so a little bit the aspect, I think, and I don't want to be too retrograde here, but is maybe reconnecting like 
it was in the, the good parts of the good old days. You know, we've had, we have rural communities in Australia, we've had neighbourhoods in Australia that were very connected. People helped out each other in the Depression, etc., etc. So maybe some, t some of this aspect of you know, how we define social cohesion is to remember a little bit what our grandparents used to do, they used to share, you know, they used to share produce over the garden, they used to share, you know, they had too many apples or too many p potatoes or too many carrots, and they would just share things around. Clothes would be shared, all that sort of stuff, it was normal. We've lost that, and maybe part of what we're trying to do is to recapture, and, you know, so it's probably, maybe not, maybe we should call ourselves not Neighbourhood Connect, but Neighbourhood Reconnect. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so perhaps I'll, I'll give the panelists a choice. We're, we're running a little bit over time, but I, we started a bit late, so I hope you guys will just afford um, another, another question. So either to speak to a challenge or an obstacle which you faced, which you've turned into an opportunity or a stepping stone, because as we act, we're always faced with crisis and victory and Victory follows prices and prices follows victory. <laughs> it's just the nature of things. Or to speak to the impact of the initiative. You know, what changes have you seen in individuals, the community, or in cultural norms? So it's up to you which you would like to speak to. And you would like to. May is smiling at me, God like knows. very beautifully. <laughs> so I'm like. <laughs> um, maybe a challenge that was turned into a stepping stone. Um, as a young person, to pitch a project for young people, to work with more young people in a system that maybe doesn't value the voices of young people is quite difficult. Um, so uh, for a lot of the projects, it required us to walk into like um, theaters and just talk to big boss people and talk with confidence, um, trying to explain to them this vision that we had for what we wanted to do and um, that it wasn't just a vision, that we had seen it come to life. We have proof. Um, so a lot of people just said no, <laughs> just straight up no. But we just kept going, and as we kept going, we realized that maybe we weren't using the right words to describe what we were saying and what we meant. What we truly meant wasn't coming out in the sentences that we, that we had. So the more people said no, the more we refined our ability to express what it is that we were doing. Um, so the challenge was that maybe the systems don't have the conviction that young people can be a driving force, but because of that, young people have to sharpen their tool, and then maybe by the time it gets sharp enough, then it can cause a little bit of an impact. Thank you. Would you like to speak? <laughs> um, I can speak to uh, the impact, and um, just from what the, the young people told me was. Um, because we, I guess I didn't explain it very articulately when I presented, but what we did was role play some of the situations that they were facing, not just on a one-off basis, but on a regular basis. So unfortunately, they could predict that this was going to happen to them again. And it was about role playing those situations and having people come in, play the bully in that, play the bullied in that story, and test out different strategies. And we could debate whether that strategy would work in real life or whether it wouldn't. So the young people told me that they they felt um, that they were better, these are not their direct words of course, but that they felt better equipped with strategies to reach out to other people, um, to identify allies such as teachers, but also just amongst each other because they were going to be in the playground together at school, they better knew how to support each other. Um, so that, and, and through the, the games and the trust building exercises we did, um, we created social cohesion within that group of young people that we worked with. And then the other thing is, um, I guess, it's, I'll, I'll be brief, but I guess it was a slight challenge that it wasn't a, some, of, some of our other programs that we run that are structured. Um, this is sort of a drop in, you can come in on, on any Friday and not come in on any Friday, there was no sort of commitment. So it was about how do we get young people support if they're not coming back. And thankfully, through starts, we have connections to the schools, and we knew which school these young people were attending. And so we could reach out to the school through, um, we had school liaison offices, and we had access to the school, a good relationship with the school, to let them know um, that the young people had shared this. They were aware, of course, that there was something going on in their school, but um, those young people were able to um, receive support from the school itself. So that was a pretty concrete um, outcome. 
Yeah, maybe a couple of words on uh, impact and sustainability. Um, it's been an interesting uh, impact not only on the individuals participating but also on the collectors. So people have just gotten a lot of joy out of organising other people to be connected. So that's been an unexpected impact and people just say, oh, we love doing this, we just love connection. Um, impact also in figures is quite interesting and there's interesting learning there. One of the, the example groups I put up on the screen there, they have 125 people on their email list. About half show up at least once a year to an event, so that's about 60, 70. When I go to an average, and I'm a, 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 as a visitor to one of their events, four or five people show up. So 125, 66 is sort of the thing. So the impact might well be, oh, there's a potentially a place to go, even if I don't participate in maybe only participate once a year, or maybe never. We all know in, in healthcare or whatever, the placebo effect. You know, you give somebody a medication that's just, you know, a, a, a water or sugar, and they feel better. Maybe the fact that they're on a list that if they felt lonely, or if they felt lonely, they could go and meet up with, is already has an effect, even though they never actually participate. So that's an interesting part of the aspect, uh, of impact. The, um, um, so the impact might be much bigger than this, than this seven or eight people you might see in one of the photos. The other thing is sustainability. Um, obviously, with pretty much zero funding, we've designed it to be you know, sustainable. So it's not a one, like one of those projects we know many of where you know, somebody gives some money and it goes splendidly, and the money runs out, everything stops. Some of our groups have been going in for four or five years. They've had changes, generational changes of connectors. Uh, it's very important that this change that we're looking for is sustainable because if there's a loss of funding or a change of government or a change of whatever and it stops, then we haven't achieved our goal. Um, maybe one thing to take this opportunity to emphasize is um, seeing evidence of how how bringing together young people are. I think any nucleus of people that come, and it's amazing to see it even amongst young people, I should say, on a regular basis to reflect on their patterns of thought and action, seeing how culture can shift. Yeah. So there are particular norms that might come, you know, when you when you sit with these, and it's so, I don't know, when last, we were all in high school, but these kinds of things come home and they're ways of thinking, ways of dealing with problems um, that maybe are more violent in nature or, um, you know, what's cool and all these standards that come from society. And when you form these groups, starting to see young people decide for themselves and decide not to to go against and do things differently. You know, we don't speak like that because we, in our junior youth group, this is what we've decided. Or when we have a, um, you know, if someone does something that we don't agree with, the way that we handle it, you know, it's not through anger, it's through talking about it, that we are able to interact and enjoy with, you know, with adults and parents. And I think seeing these cultural shifts um, start to emerge is probably one of the most profound impacts that I've experienced um, working with you. With my thoughts on big ideas are very new, so we're in the early stages, but um, it's going well. I guess an excitement for us is that there's an eagerness from the local community. Um, there's a hunger to meet, uh, there's a hunger to explore ideas, and then to get involved. And we're just hoping to see that gradually, the ripple effect grow. Obviously, I'm excited to see other local councils pick it up. Um, and I guess re-echoing the message from this morning from Hugh, again, governments are top down. I work in a community development team in government, which is pretty funny because that's, you know, oxymoron, community development's ground up. So I work in a funny position within the government, but really the answer is, again, from the local grassroots getting together. So um, it's very early days, but we're anticipating very first time we're trying to work out what other things to hang off this forum. We run many, many other activities, which I won't go into detail now, but that's of time, but that's where we're at. Yeah. And congratulations to the council of doing this. Uh, I was yeah. speaking last week at the Mountain Peninsula Council in Victoria, and they are similarly enlightened. But talking about challenges, I think with one of the questions we find many councils are not very supportive. So one of our collectors might go and say, "Oh, can we have that little community hall for a couple of hours?" And the council says, "Yes, put down ten thousand dollars deposit. It's yours." <laughs> And please thank our panelists. Yes.